coral reefs are some of the most biologically diverse and important ecosystems that we have on Earth. In fact, despite only covering 1% of the sea floor, they are home to 25% of all marine life. It is estimated that up to 2 million different species inhabit coral reefs, rivaling the biodiversity of the rainforest. They aren't just vital to marine life though, as over 500 million people worldwide depend on coral reefs for food, income, coastal protection, and more. They are incredibly valuable to our global economy, and by one estimate, the economic goods and services provided by reefs are worth about $375 billion each year. But unfortunately, coral reefs around the world are struggling. Among the many threats facing reefs right now, the largest would have to be climate change and ocean acidification. When a coral is stressed by these changing conditions, it will expel the algae that lives inside of its tissues which can cause it to die. This algae is known as zooxanthellae. See, corals and zooxanthellae work together in what is called an endosymbiotic relationship. The coral provides shelter and a place to live, while the algae produces nutrients for the coral to eat through photosynthesis. When a coral is separated from all of its algae, it is a process known as coral bleaching. Mass global bleaching events were once rare, but are now happening far more often and intensely. Over 50% of the world's coral reefs have died in the last 30 years, and up to 90% may die within the next century if we don't take meaningful action to prevent it. Thankfully, there is hope that the reefs can return one day. To learn more, let's visit the Coral Restoration Foundation in Key Largo, Florida, a nonprofit marine conservation organization using cutting edge science to lead the charge against the rapid reef decay seen in the Florida Reef Tract. The Florida Reef Tract, it's the only, the largest reef in the continent of the United States. So it, it's sort of, it, it's a national historic landmark essentially. And the Keys in particular rely on the tourism that's generated from the reef. I mean, that's why we have a community down here is because there was a reef here. Aside from sort of the global stressors like, like global climate change, global warming, um, the Keys themselves have had a lot of anthropogenic stressors, whether it's from development and sedimentation runoff, um, whether it's from the, the sewer system pollution problem that the Keys has had. Um, aside from that, it's sort of just the stress and the pressure that's put on the reef from all of the different activities, from people boating, from people diving, people fishing, to, to commercial fishing boats. You know, the Keys, some surveys have said that we've lost anywhere from 80 to 90 percent of the coral cover that we used to have, and that would be 30 to 40 years ago. So that's a very, very uh, rapid, drastic decline in coral cover that we haven't seen anywhere else in the world. CRF's main focus is restoring the Florida Reef Tract, um, you know, actively outplanting corals to it. We do this in a kind of a three-pronged approach. We have our restoration program. We're doing the active restoration. We're going out on the boats, we're growing the corals, cleaning the structures, fragmenting them, outplanting the corals. From there, we have our education department, and that handles everything from volunteers to interns to actually having educational programs. So we go into schools, elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, colleges. We have college groups come down here and do programs with us to learn about the reefs, to learn about restoration, what we're doing. All of that, anywhere from you know, educational programs to you know, we have a Captain Coral sort of show for little kids. The third program we have is our science department or our science program. And that works in tandem with the restoration department to determine best practices. So not only are we actively outplanting corals, but we're also trying to study the best ways to do that. In addition to their educational activities, the Coral Restoration Foundation engages the public in their mission through their dive programs. These programs allow volunteers to join the team in the classroom and in the water to participate in the coral restoration process firsthand. 
This is a strategy that is greatly beneficial as it spreads awareness about the challenges facing coral reefs while contributing to the restoration effort itself. Coral restoration is still a growing field, but with the help from volunteers, CRF is able to scale up their efforts and transplant far more corals per year than if it were just up to their team. Throughout the Florida Keys, all the way up from Key Largo to Key West, we have seven nurseries. We actually have eight now because we just started a shallow water nursery out at Pickles Reef. But at these nurseries, we have our coral trees, which grow the different species of corals. Most of our coral trees are staghorn and elkhorn. That's what we produce the most of. The trees are five feet tall and three feet wide and can hold up to 60 corals. The corals are suspended in the water column, so that allows for them to get ample um, water flow, ample nutrients, and oxygen as the, as the water passes through them. They are also um, less exposed to predators and competitors, such as algae and fire coral and other kind of things that would compete with the corals. Additionally, the coral tree was designed to be raised and lowered using a special knot. So during the winter time, we like to raise our trees up closer to the surface so that they are in slightly warmer waters. In the summertime, however, we want to pull them as far down as possible to try to stay a little bit cooler to help prevent any sort of bleaching events. Basically, we want to make sure that we're sampling genotypes we're sampling individual coral colonies from a wide range of reefs across the Florida Keys. So we're maintaining the sort of genetic diversity that the natural reef has. We don't want to just collect corals from one reef and then put them out on the entire Florida reef tract. Once the fragments are in the nursery, um, you know, they go from maybe hand-sized or finger-sized to about a basketball in anywhere from nine months to a year. What we do from there then is what's called asexual fragmentation or asexual propagation. We'll take that basketball sized colony and fragment it into four or five different, um, you know, sort of hand sized pieces. We'll outplant four of those and we'll rehang that last fifth piece for it to regrow again next year. And so that's sort of the, where we have this sustainable stock of coral growing. We frag just enough to outplant and then we leave just enough in the nursery so that it regrows for next year. Essentially, when we first started, we did this in an exponential level. We only outplanted two fragments and hung up three. And so we're increasing our coral by threefold kind of every year. Um, we're at the point where we no longer need to do that and we can start outplanting most of the tissue that we have. There's two coral species that we primarily work with. This is staghorn acropora cervicornis and elkhorn acropora palmata. Used to be the two most dominant species in the Keys. And so they've actually lost upwards of 95% of all tissue that used to be in the wild on the reefs naturally. Um, and that's just, I mean, that's a huge drastic decline. It's unthinkable. A big important thing about these two species is that because they're one of the most dominant, they're also the most dominant reef building. They, they, their skeletons break down, they grow, and they form what is the limestone that actually makes the structure of the reef. Um, so they, they form the habitat that is what in quote unquote the coral reef. That third final step is actually the outplanting of the corals on the reef. We are translocating them from our nursery, cutting them, fragmenting it, and then essentially gluing them to the reef. We use a two-part marine epoxy. You know, think of it like clay or Play-Doh. Um, it hardens in about 45 minutes, and it is essentially just a glue that holds the coral to the reef. In anywhere from like a month to two months, the coral will have skirted its tissue over that that glue, that attachment point, and will start to grow onto the reef itself. And that's kind of our goal of what we want to see. And then the end, end, end goal of that third step of outplanting is to go back and monitor our corals and to, to see them spawn naturally. Since their founding in 2007, the Coral Restoration Foundation has seen tremendous success with many of their goals. To date, they have returned more than 140,000 critically endangered corals back onto the Florida reef track. Many of these corals have now grown into thriving colonies with the ability to sexually reproduce via spawning, kickstarting the reef's natural process of recovery. In fact, in 2009, CRF made history as their outplanted corals became the first documented nursery-raised corals in history to spawn in the wild. 
the Keys is kind of the forefront in this, in this global coral decline problem. You know, we know it's happening here. We've been seeing it happen for 20 and 30 years. And CRF is actively trying to come up with ways to combat that. How can we bring it back? How can we fix it? How can we apply the techniques we're doing in the Keys to elsewhere in the world who are now just starting to see this massive decline that we've already had here? Uh, a big issue with um, the decline of coral reefs and the, the field of coral restoration is out of sight, out of mind. We're dealing with a problem that the everyday person doesn't see every day, um, won't see every day. Most people probably won't experience in their lifetime. Um, and so it's, you know, the reefs are underwater. Not everyone lives near a coral reef. Not everyone can be a scuba diver. Um, not everyone is a swimmer, even. And so it's, it's really, you know, CRF, um, not struggles, but um, it, it's a big issue about getting the problem out and making people aware of it, um, and making people aware of, of how, um, how important it is, and how, you know, oh, it's a coral reef, it's in the water, like, why should I care about that? And the, the really big thing is that these coral reefs affect everyone around the world, um, whether it's via economic value from tourism, whether it's you're getting your seafood, you know, you like to eat sushi, that those fish come from a reef somewhere around the world, um, and it's all interconnected, it's all tied together. And you know, as a species, humans have never seen the total decline of an ecosystem. Um, we've never experienced what would happen if we lost all of the rainforests in the world. And we're getting really close to that point with coral reefs. You know, in the next 50 years, if we don't take considerable action and, and uh, meaningful action, we will see the almost near decline of all of the coral reefs in the world. And we know it's gonna be bad, but we don't know what will happen because we've never had that happen in our lifetimes before. Um, and so it's really important that we get across that we can't let it get to that point. You know, as a species, as, as stewards of our planet, um, we, we don't want to find out what happens if we lose coral reefs because we know it's going to be bad. We know it's going to be really bad. Um, and so uh, it's really important that, you know, we need to do things now and not 50 years in the future. Um, and those things could include, you know, coming and volunteering for CRF. They could include donating your money, donating your time. They could include lobbying for appropriate legislation um, or for appropriate, you know, green environmental candidates. Um, there's lots of things you can do, even if you're not a scuba diver, even if you're not a snorkeler, um, that will have a direct impact on coral reefs around the world. Thank you so much. Awesome. Yeah.